Hello and welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. In this hour, we continue our exploration of public corruption. We'll examine the specific allegations related to the U.S. President Donald Trump, his family and associates, and what their effect might be on governance in society. Joining us are two experts. Matthew Stevenson is a professor at Harvard Law School and the author of Corruption in Democratic Institutions and the book Legislation and Regulation. Also joining us is Richard Gordon. He's a professor at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, and he's the director of the Program on Financial Integrity, and he's the director of the Institute for Security, Law, and Policy. His publications include Moving Money, International Financial Flows, Taxes, and Money Laundering, Losing the War Against Dirty Money, and Terrorism Financing in the United States. Welcome back to the Scholars Circle. It's great to have the two of you back with us. I hate to keep having to revisit The discussion about corruption, particularly in the USA, but I'm really glad that you're with us to help us understand what's happening. Matthew Stevenson, your project of tracking the allegations of corruption, the credible ones, in the Trump administration, I thought you could walk us through what some of these allegations are, the credible ones. Can you walk us through that? I'd be happy to do my best, although one of the challenges and one of the reasons that my collaborators and I started trying to keep track of these allegations on the blog that I run, the Global Anti-Corruption blog, is that there's so much going on, it's in some ways difficult to keep track. We started this project because of concerns right at the outset of the Trump administration that uh, President Trump and his family seemed less inclined to adhere to the normal ethical rules that previous presidents had uh, followed, and that there were concerns, serious concerns, that President Trump, uh, members of his family and and other members of his his inner circle, uh, were going to use the office of the presidency and President Trump's position to enrich themselves and their family and, and close cronies or associates along lines that may be less familiar to 21st century Americans, but are quite familiar to citizens of many other countries in the world, whether it's Silvio Berlusconi in Italy or Thaksin Shinawatra in Thailand or Jacob Zuma in South Africa or what have you. So we started trying to keep track of, uh, as you say, not necessarily proven, but but credible allegations in uh, at least four categories. One consists of situations where President Trump, through his decisions, obligates the United States government to make payments to businesses under control by the Trump Organization. So this would include things like requiring the Secret Service, the Department of Defense to rent out space in Trump Tower, the regular Trump trips to uh, Mar-a-Lago and the Bedminster Golf Club, obligating the Secret Service and other U.S. government entities to uh, spend money there. Uh, and so forth. Then there's a second category of behavior we've seen, which you can think of the use of the power, uh, prestige, and general publicity associated with the office of the president or the United States government to promote Trump brand. So this can be things as seemingly uh, trivial or small as, as Melania Trump putting up advertisements for her jewelry line on the White House website, Donald Trump fairly shortly after he assumed office tweeting about how it was terrible that Nordstrom dropped Ivanka's brand, mm-hmm. Kelly M. Conway explicitly endorsing the Trump brand uh, in the White House, and other sorts of activities along uh, those lines. Then, uh, maybe moving into more troubling territory, there are a lot of credible allegations that uh, members of the Trump administration, including President Trump or members of his family, uh, may be allowing the private business interests of Trump associates or Trump affiliated businesses to influence decision making on important policy issues. And there are a lot of these allegations. A lot of them are difficult to prove. A lot of it could just be circumstance, but there are a whole lot of these examples. Um, I'm not sure if I can run through them all adequately, uh, but there's certainly a bunch of them. And then there are also examples kind of related to that third category of situations where you see private interests, often foreign interests or foreign government interests, uh, apparently attempting to influence the Trump administration through dealings with Trump, 
businesses and sometimes the Trump organization or members of the Trump family seeming to encourage this. So the the most well-known example here, although maybe one of the least significant, are these controversies surrounding the Trump International Hotel in Washington, D.C., where according at least to uh, lawsuits that have been filed, there are actually people who work for that hotel who are going around trying to drum up diplomatic business, emphasizing the fact that you know, this is President Trump's hotel and this is a, a good way to ingratiate yourself with them. Sometimes they don't even need to say that. Uh, there are also concerns that President Trump's business interests in places like China, for example, may influence his decisions on China policy or that his business interests or Jared Kushner's interests in the Middle East or Gulf states might be influencing U.S. policy in those regions as well. So those are some examples. I could take up all the time we had <laughs> if I went through example after example, uh, but there are a lot. One last thing I will say about is in many cases, the most troubling potential examples aren't proven. We don't know for sure that China's decision to grant President Trump these trademarks that he was seeking in China actually influenced his decision making regarding diplomacy towards China. But for a lot of the smaller, uh, seemingly less consequential examples, we know for sure that President Trump or members of his administration are skirting or crossing ethical lines in a, in a way that seems to be intended to pursue their own profits. And one of the reasons that I'm concerned is you, you see enough of these little incidents that means for the bigger incidents, even though we don't have conclusive proof, there are certainly reasons to be worried. Matthew Stevenson, you're a quantitative guy. You measure things. What is the magnitude that we're talking about here? I sometimes measure things when there are things that can be measured, but I think it's oftentimes a mistake to try to artificially quantify things where we don't really have good, solid numbers. This is actually an area where I think it would be, to my mind, a mistake to pr try to put some kind of a dollar figure or numerical figure or some kind of percentage value on how much of what the Trump administration is doing is intended to, to profit Trump organization businesses. These are either things that can't be quantified or where we just don't have the numbers. I've talked to fellow researchers, economists, for example, who have looked into trying to figure out what the price premium at Trump properties looks like as a result of Trump becoming president. But it turns out the data is just so noisy. It's, re it's really difficult uh, to detect those sorts of things quantitatively. It doesn't, maybe there's someone out there who's done it, but I haven't seen really credible estimates to, to quantify these things. So you have to rely more on qualitative evidence for the kinds of things we're concerned about. Richard Gordon, you have also looked at the aides and the money laundering that they have been involved in. What would you add to this? Well, certainly Paul Manafort and his friend Mr. Gates appear to have just done good old-fashioned classic but low-end money laundering to get their cash in from uh, the Ukrainian accounts. So I think they should have taken my course so they would know <laughs> how to have done a better job at it uh, because I really laid themselves open for that and, of course, for tax evasion. Um, but I think what's interesting is, and particularly, Matthew, your, I just want to thank you for your blog. It's incredibly helpful trying to keep everything in order and make sense of all of it. And so I just would like to you and my students to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for doing this. But the one thing that's probably doesn't quite fit into any of the four categories that you mentioned, it seems that what's at least the hints of what's going on there are really quite obvious. So, you know, the self-dealing, really obvious, the kind of marketing that they were doing, number two is really sort of obvious. And for number three, the using influence to help their private businesses or getting foreign governments to, uh, to do things for uh, Trump properties, it, it all is kind of right out there in your face. But there are a couple of things that I kind of wonder that might be more beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't just be money laundering. It's sort of more the techniques of money laundering. Or it could even be that if you have control over a good deal of U.S. government apparatus, then you might be able to, your organizations, well, either you or your organization or people who are working for you, might be able to sell a kind of money laundering service. And mm -hmm. I think this is what uh, Adam Davidson was getting at in his piece in the New Yorker back in August. 
where it just looks like a classic uh, proceeds of crime, money laundering. You build a hotel in Batumi, which is basically like building a hotel. And I apologize to the Republic of Georgia, but really it's like building a hotel in the middle of a cesspool. It just makes absolutely no sense. So mm-hmm. usually when you see buildings go up someplace where they don't belong, you think, well, that might be a money laundering operation. And the reason it is, if you have proceeds of crime and you want to turn that into something that doesn't look like proceeds of crime, but it looks like proceeds of legitimate activity, one of the classical ways to do that is to build a sort of a fake building. And you say, gee, all this money that I got from stealing from the public fisc or selling illegal drugs really comes from rents. And if you build these buildings in the middle of nowhere, they really become sort of Potemkin village buildings. And that's how, without spending too much money, how you can create a way of turning dirty money into washing it into, into clean money. And it seems that that may well have happened, or at least there's a lot of suggestion that happened, not that Trump or anybody in the Trump organization may, you know, specifically conspired to do this, but exactly why he got, they got a million dollars and clearly that millions were, were invested in what turns out to be not a real hotel, uh, using lots of shell companies without any sort of due diligence being done, um, self-dealing with banks. So I wonder if there might be more instances of that going on. And I should probably sort of of a slightly less hidden or money laundering agency type of activity is when you have somebody who needs money and they don't care whether it's criminal proceeds or if it's proceeds of legitimate um, economic activity. For example, I need people to invest in 666 Madison Avenue. I bought this building when it wasn't worth very much and its value has fallen since then. Um, so what do I do? Well, uh, who is willing to invest in this building? It's kind of a little, a little bit like building a fake building somewhere and saying, gee, this is where we're going to launder our proceeds. But typically, this will be a place to park your proceeds at the end. So you're not just trying to cover up and show, gee, it was not money for, that I'd stolen from uh, the Russian people or indirect directly or indirectly through Gazprom or something, but I've done this, I've acquired it in, in an illegal way, and eventually I need to park it someplace in an asset. And yep. so I launder it somewhere else, and then I invest in real estate. Now, clearly this has been going on in London and in the U.S. There are literally hundreds of examples that have been exposed. But what if I'm, I don't know, just picking a name out of somewhere – uh, Jared Kushner, and I need to get someone to invest in my building. And I say, well, I'm not going to do any due diligence, including my bank. I'll work with my bankers to find out if the money that is coming into either as a loan, or could be a fake Manafort-style loan or a real loan, but or just an actual purchase of a building. And even though the building is worth considerably less than the purchase price, that's okay because what I'm doing is taking proceeds of crime and getting them into an asset, which then is owned, partially owned, controlled by somebody very close to the president who happens to know the attorney general. And this additional premium will be paid because you think, hey, the president of the United States is going to make sure that there's no money laundering investigation here. And so the criminals abroad will be safe knowing that I bought this building as opposed to buying a building that isn't owned by the president's son-in-law, but somebody legitimate who might do a little due diligence and maybe somebody would be more likely in the attorney general's office, uh, somebody running, say, for governor, I don't know, New York, to say, gee, I'll go after somebody, but not someone who can crush me politically. And Matthew Stevenson. I know you'll have other issues you want to discuss, so just a couple of points, or reactions quickly without trying to cover everything in, in, in what you just said, uh, with, which I tend to agree with. The first is that with respect to money laundering concerns involving President Trump or the Trump Organization, it's important to emphasize that these concerns well precede his entry into politics, uh, let alone his actually becoming president. Uh, the Adam Davidson story, which you referred uh, with respect to the hotel in Georgia, this, this involves events that well preceded Trump running for president. And you don't even need to go as far as Georgia. I gather there's, there's reason to believe that some of these Trump properties in the U.S., including Trump Tower, uh, have engaged in some fairly shady transactions from from way back that people connected to the Russian mob 
were among the first buyers of luxury condominiums in the in Trump Tower when it looked like it was not going to be a, a terribly a large success. So yeah, so all these things are concerns. I mean, they're concerns that you know I, I was focusing in the blog and in my earlier comments on forms of corruption that are really using the office of the presidency to enrich oneself in, in the ways that I described. But if you, as you say, if you expand the category to consider other potentially illicit illegal activities in relation to money laundering or financial crime, you know, who knows what one would find if one dug deeper. Second thing is with relation to, to shell companies and secretive buyers, one of the stories that we included in the blog is that According to reporting by USA Today of all places, which is not normally an outlet I think is, is one associated with hard-hitting investigative journalism, I believe it was their original reporting, that found that with respect to Trump Organization real estate sales, although a couple years before President Trump was the Republican nominee, only about 4% of those sales were to buyers who were essentially hidden through anonymous shell company structures, uh, that number is way, way up. As of 2017, something like more than $35 million in Trump Organization real estate sales were to uh, shell companies where we don't actually know the, the true identity of the buyer, something like over 70% of purchases of Trump real estate. So this is, I think, to your point, this, this is certainly a matter of concern. One final thing I'll note is a bit, it's kind of interesting to observe that despite everything you just said, as far as I know, the Kushner companies have still not been able to find a buyer <laughs> or financing for that troubled property at, uh, at 666, which maybe is just a suggestion of just how bad an investment uh, that was. Uh, it may also be that now that there's so much scrutiny on these issues, it may actually be harder than the Trump family might have once uh, supposed, or maybe harder for other folks who might want to launder money to do it through the Trump organization. I mean, I, right now, if I were, if I wanted to launder a big chunk of money, I'm not sure uh, Jared Kushner would be my best bet, despite the fact that he's the president's <laughs> son-in-law, because we have so many people looking at exactly these issues. Right? It was better when this was just a when Trump was just kind of a buffoonish. A reality TV show host because you didn't have the best and brightest legal minds in the the U.S. government scrutinizing all of their finances. So so sometimes they just be careful what you wish for. Exactly right. That is precisely right. There was also a Time magazine article last November that wrote about a Trump deal making tens of millions of dollars in profits, allowing Colombian drug cartels to launder money through a hotel in Panama. Yeah, this is the Global Witness Report. That's yeah. right. If you talk to a devout Trump supporter and you lay this out, the response you might get, and I say this because I've had kind of this sort of response, is, so what? So let's answer that question. Matthew Stevenson, so what? So it's a great question. I suppose there are two ways I can I can interpret your question. One is you're actually asking me to try to explain to your general listening audience you know, why should one care about this. The other way to interpret this question is what's what's the psychology of the Trump supporters who don't see this as a problem and how can we try to frame this or discuss this issue in a way that is not going to reach the hardest of hardcore, uh, but to try to sort of understand the psychology of people who don't don't see this as a problem. So uh, I'm not sure which one you meant, but let me see if I can take a crack at both of them. I think with respect to the first, you know, some people might say, well, it's kind of, it's kind of self-evidently a problem if the president of the United States and his family are facilitating money laundering by the Russian mob and Colombia drug cartels. Um, but in case that's not self-evident, I would say there are, there are a couple of serious adverse consequences that can flow for when you see this kind of put aside the money laundering and the potential, again, helping criminal gangs launder money, just what I, what I call in the blog presidential profiteering. So why might this be a problem? A, a few reasons. One is that some of these forms of presidential profiteering involve distortions of U.S. policy. So you know, I'm, I'm not sure I necessarily disagree with the policy decisions that have made with respect to, say, China or aspects of Middle Eastern diplomacy. But if it is, in fact, the case that U.S. policy in these matters is being shaped by the business interests of Trump uh, or his family, well, then I think that's a, a big issue in the same way that I think most Americans would care if their public servants were taking direct bribes. I think if what our law enforcement agencies look into or don't look into is being influenced by the interests of the private business interests of public officials, and that would be a big problem with respect to the integrity of law enforcement. So I suppose 
that the most direct and obvious reason one ought to be concerned about this is that it might involve serious distortions of U.S. policy, potentially in directions that are not in the best interest of the country. Now, one might reasonably say, well, okay, but then why do we care if Kellyanne Conway says buy Ivanka Trump's shoes? I mean, why do those sorts of things matter? Why do we care if the State Department website is contrary to government regulations advertising the Mar-a-Lago resort? Um, I think that there are a couple of reasons we would care about those sorts of things. The first is, as I said before, that kind of behavior may be circumstantial evidence that sheds light on the motive and attitude towards public office that, that these folks have, which may increase our concern that the alleged but unproven allegations and actual policy distortions are more likely. Second, I do think that you can get these cascading changes in norms of public integrity and public administration that can be corrosive to not only how our government functions, but how our society functions, that can be quite destructive. So to take an example that's a little bit removed maybe from from corruption or profiteering, uh, consider compliance with uh, your obligation to pay taxes. So as a a colleague and friend of mine pointed out in some research and writing he did on this issue, the probability of actually getting audited uh, and caught evading your taxes or not paying your fair share is for most people very, very small. So part of the reason that people are willing to pay their taxes is what, what scholars sometimes refer to as tax morale. Also an overestimate of the probability you're audited, but kind of the idea, look, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what most people do that, you know, if you, your attitude should not be, let me try to game the system and see if I can avoid getting caught. And the more people in high places exhibit an attitude that everything really is about lining one's own pockets or benefiting one's own interests, the more corrosive I think this, this tends to be uh, for these broader social norms. And I think there's, there's certainly evidence suggesting that this is the case. In the most recent Transparency International Global Corruption Barometer Survey of the United States, the percentage of people who think that corruption is widespread in the United States government has gone way up since a couple of years ago. And so it can't just be a a partisan flipping. There's actually a perception that this problem is more widespread. And there's a reasonable amount of social science evidence suggesting that when people think corruption is widespread, Um, Their confidence in the government declines, their confidence in democracy as a a viable uh, and and good system uh, declines, that you see all sorts of other problems. I I want you to remember that you just said that about democracy, because I would like to close with some questions about that. So go ahead with with part two. But just just. So everything I said, I think, is the real reason we should be concerned about that. But if the way you frame the question is, you know, a Trump supporter looks at this and says, so what? And I worry a little bit that everything I said, if you have any you know, hardcore Trump out supporters in your listening audience out there, they might have listened to everything I said and still say, so what? And this doesn't seem like that big a deal. And some of them might say, hey, you know, you – ivory tower academic elite types are trying to rig the system so that it's too hard for a successful businessman to become our political leader. That all of these concerns about the mixture of public roles and private business interests are essentially a way to say, hey, if you're a a business tycoon, or at least you want to remain active as a business tycoon, you can't be in public office. I don't think that's actually true. I think if you look over our history, we have plenty of people who are successful business people who got involved in public life and they they weren't really stopped by these norms that we had about not mixing your public and private feelings. But I I do think that's that's the line that many would take. And frankly, I wish I had a good answer to what one could say to such people to convince them that this is a big problem. I mean, I might say look elsewhere. I might say look at Italy, look at South Africa, look at Thailand, look at Argentina, look at uh, many of these other places where this this attitude about the proper role of of government and the separation between uh, public role and private business interests has been eroded and it's had these bad consequences. But I I tend to think that those comparative international examples are not going to cut much ice with the kind of make America great again crowd. So I'm not sure. I, I'm sort of, I hate to end on kind of hopeless note, but I'm not actually sure how to reach those people. And I'm, I think that as seriously as I think these issues ought to be taken, I'm not sure if the goal is political persuasion. This is the way to do it. Unless maybe this is the best way you can do it politically, if you can connect it to drugs, organized crime, terrorism, 
that might start to resonate. If you can illustrate hypocrisy in some way, maybe that might start to resonate. But again, I don't think the real reasons to worry about this are reasons that are likely to be that persuasive to the folks who are big fans of the current president. So I'm going to pass that now to you, Richard Gordon. The question is, so what? And, you know, um, Matthew Stevenson was talking about, I don't know how to convince the diehard Trump supporter. And I wonder also if um, the Republican side of the Congress falls into that camp. So, so what? I do agree with everything you just said, Matthew. I think that's all completely spot on. I'm not sure that Trump supporters are thinking so much about Trump still as they are about his former opponent. That seems to be what he's thinking about all the time. So I was having lunch yesterday uh, with a friend of mine um, who is former FBI and make sure I keep this disguised well enough. uh, And uh, a number of other people who are former and current FBI. And there was a a huge disagreement among this group of people, including at one point, one of them stormed out and yelled and walked away because the majority of current and former FBI folks were Trump supporters. Now, how could you be an FBI person and be a supporter of someone who has been attacking you indirectly, but certainly the organization for which you have given and could actually literally give your life? and still be a Trump supporter. And I went around the table and the answer was better than Hillary. Hillary was even more corrupt. And if you start going point by point, take Matthew's entire blog, for example, and go point by point through the kind of at least potential corruption, or at least it appears some fair amount of evidence that it's convincing evidence of corruption. And you say, how, what do you mean compared to what, what, what did she do? She didn't do anything. And, uh, the response just is this visceral hatred of Hillary Clinton. So I'm not sure that they're even thinking about the adverse effects of possible government corruption in the U.S. Their own organization, the FBI, is an institution upon which so much American security, individual security, and economic security too, rests. They're working for this place. And its sort of institutional integrity is intentionally attacked and slowly being dismembered by this administration. And they still don't care because they hate Hillary. It it blows my mind. And what is fascinating about that, because I've heard this also just among everyday people, is that she's not president. So even if she has done these things as a private citizen, it's not the same as when you have somebody at the head of a country who is acting in this way. It's fascinating. It's, it's utterly fascinating, but it's, it's the hatred of her, and I could, you know, I think there's been a fair amount of speculation on this. It's also an interesting way to keep the focus away from him. The destruction of institutions. You know, I worked for the IMF for a long time, particularly working on anti-corruption before I got into the anti-money laundering business. And uh, yeah, I was chased out of Kenya. The government actually put a contract out on it. And the courts didn't work, the police didn't work, and now at least there had been a little bit of transparency because of an active press. But now things have broken down so much in Kenya. That could happen. One of my colleagues is Brazilian, and actually left Brazil and came here, largely because of corruption, and now to look at what do you do when everybody is tainted by corruption. So you lose one president and then the new president is also involved, well, is involved in car wash investigations. It's, it's just a horror show. But for, as Matthew was saying, for most people, they don't get out and see that, see the kind of corrosive effect. But we, we do, but they don't. Could the culture of corruption become so accepted as a norm that the United States becomes that? Oh, I don't think so. I, it's it's, was it Casey Stengel who said it's difficult, but it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. But I, I don't think the base is so, the base of uh, institutions, the key institutions in the economy is that uh, the mere fact that Mueller has been able to proceed with his investigation and co- turn up indictments, even though you have the president blaspheming him constantly, attacking him and everything, witch hunt, et cetera. And yet there's still enough integrity in the system. And still the the diehard Trump supporters who would continue to support him if he took out his gun and 
New York and shot somebody. First of all, I don't think they're that, most of them are that strong in support. And number two, they're still a significant minority. I, I don't think he would ever be able to muster, or he in any capacity, be able to muster the kind of support he would need really further to erode the you know, confidence in our major institutions. Matthew Stevenson, let's bring you back in on this. When you look globally at the issues of corruption, the cultures of corruption, the norms of corruption, where would you say the U.S. could go? Where are the institutions and where could it go compared with other countries? So there's the question of where could it go and where it's likely to go. In terms of where it's likely to go, I think I'm in fairly strong agreement with Richard that if I were a a gambler, I would put my money on U.S. institutions basically surviving this and, you know, things probably getting a bit better after the, you know, the next 2018 and then 2020 Hmm. elections. I think our, our, our politics is still all sorts of pathologies that are pretty deeply entrenched. But if if the question is, do I think that we're going to, you know, end up looking like South Africa or I guess I was about to say Argentina, or I think they're actually looking up in Argentina, but Argentina until until fairly recently or any any number of these other countries we've talked about, or even Italy, I would say the odds are against it. I think pretty strongly against it. That said, Whenever you know you read your history books, you learn your history, and you and, you, and we were studying some crisis where everything things really did collapse or spin out of control or horrible things happened. You you, you tend to see people say, "Well, you know, I didn't really think it could happen. It seemed so unlikely," and the, and and it is unlikely. It always is unlikely, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. One of the scary things about living through history is you kind of don't know how things are going to come out on the other side. I think the way I put it the last time I was on your program is we're experiencing what you might think of as a stress test of American (laughs) political and legal institutions in the sense that uh, for a long time, we all told ourselves, we, that is Americans, like to tell ourselves this comforting story about the genius of our institutional design and the separation of powers and our norms of the rule of law and how robust they were against the potential threats of some kind of a collapse of democracy or, or, or tyranny or whatever language people like to use. But the fact is that our institutions, I don't think we're were really placed, at least not in recent history, under substantial stress in the form of political leaders or a political movement who didn't have at least a basic commitment to the norms of democracy and separation of powers and the rule of law. And now I think it's fair to say that we are governed by a a person who has surrounded himself by, by many people and who has a base of supporters who do not have those commitments. And we're seeing what happens. And we've got, I think, a United States Congress and Senate composed of a large number of people who probably do share those commitments, but not strongly enough to do anything about them if it interferes with their policy objectives, whether that's putting the people they want on the courts or whether it's changing the tax code in a way that they view as desirable. And I look, I'm not going to get out to their sincerity. My policy views may be different, but I'm, I'm sure that many of these people are entirely sincere. And of course, it's very easy for me because my policy views are are different to castigate these people for their cowardice. But I try to imagine a situation (laughs) in which someone who who did share my policy views, but who's kind of a wacko, who's had all sorts of other wacko ideas, was was running the show. And I like to think that I would be, you know, courageous and take a stand against it and be willing to give up maybe getting the people I want on the Supreme Court for the next 30 years and not getting reforms to the tax code I think are desirable. But look, I'm not put in that situation. But the point is, I think it's actually a serious point that all those who want to be a little bit sanctimonious about the other side should should take into account. It's hard. That's why we call it courage, right? It's, it's not an act of courage if it's easy. But the larger point is that this is a real stress test for our institutions. And look, I think the story that we're likely to tell 15, 20 years from now is that even when put under this tremendous stress Ultimately, the norms were robust, and we saw a backlash against the lawlessness and the contempt for the rule of law, maybe something akin to, but on a grander scale, that we saw in the wake of Watergate, Hmm. where um, President Nixon's attempts to 
interfere with norms of independence in the Justice Department ultimately led in many ways to a strengthening of those norms. I think my colleague Jack Goldsmith has, has advanced the argument that that's likely to occur. And again, if I'm a betting man, that's the way that I bet. But there is a live possibility that things go in the other direction, not that we collapse into the state of, you know, Cambodia, but that we see a substantial degradation of our norms of uh, democracy, the rule of law, separation of powers, and our politics becomes even more uh, one that revolves around cults of personality and populist demagoguery. Again, I don't think that's likely, but it's enough of a possibility that it scares me in the same way that if you told me that you know getting on an airplane, the odds that it would crash have increased from 0.001% to 0.5%. Like, yeah, that's still a really, really small number, but God, that, 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 that would terrify me, right? That still would terrify me. me. So, so, yeah, look, I, I think I, I want to be careful not to come off as a paranoid hysteric by, by saying I think it's in any sense likely that we're going to see any kind of fundamental transformation for the worst of American institutions. But I don't think we can take it for granted. I don't think we just kind of pat ourselves on the back and tell us that, you know, somehow – will kind of muddle through. This is the nature, again, the nature of living through history is you don't just kind of get to watch it happen or read about it. We're engaged right now in an active contestation about what the norms of our politics are going to be. Richard Gordon, would you agree? Uh, well, yes, but I would add two things. I was thinking back to um, the Watergate Congress, the first Congress that was elected after Watergate. And my first job off the farm was working for a very young, 25, and was elected a congressman from Essex County, actually. Very proud. Governor Gary, of course, where gerrymandering comes from, gerrymandered uh, Essex County. But back then, well, first of all, you had a Congress that was committed to campaign finance reform and to lots of political reforms. But there was gerrymandering. There was a Republican Party and a Democratic Party that had a different center in terms of social policy and economic policy, but it was nothing as divided as it is now. So you have virtually no Republicans who agree with any Democrats on key issues of economic and social policy. That's number one. Number two, we had a, a very active, extremely legitimate print press. You had investigative reporting that was very fixed on facts. And now we don't have that. We, I mean, we have some great newspapers still, but uh, except for the Washington Post, that is at least financed by somebody who's happy to dump as much money in as necessary. Social media has taken over so much that to claim fake news is really a very easy thing to do. And lots of people believe it now because they get their, their information via social media. So when you combine the extreme polarization in part through gerrymandering, but just in part through over time, how the parties have completely separated in terms of their economic and social policies with ability to generate fake news and to claim fake news, it's, I think it's very dangerous, much more so um, than the post-Watergate period where we didn't have that. And additional part to that, I think when you mentioned something about hypocrisy, if we saw more hypocrisy exposed, but we have seen stunning hypocrisy. And I just looking at the lack at the so-called tax reform, I guess it did reform it, it's a different form. So you have a, a significant number of very senior party leaders on the Republican side who we have videotapes of them talking about the worst thing close to the worst thing in the world is to run higher deficits. It's going to result in double digit inflation. It's going to result in a debasement of the currency, et cetera, et cetera. We have to stop this. Small amounts of spending increase resulting in a higher deficit. And then immediately we'll embrace a multi-trillion dollar increase in the deficit. And it's just purest hypocrisy. We don't even have to rely on the written word. We have videos of them doing it. And then we have people like Trump saying, well, yes, you know, maybe it heard my voice on the Access Hollywood tape, but it really wasn't. And pretty soon, we're going to have technology, probably it already exists, in fact, they know it exists, where we're going to be able to create virtual reality that is virtually indistinguishable from the actual reality. So being a hypocrite, you can actually rewrite history. So I'm, I'm a little cons more concerned because of that, that once you start questioning reality, 
and you get enough people to believe that you can't turn to the New York Times or Washington Post or even Walter Cronkite uh, and believe what he says. And then you have politicians who are so divided in terms of ideology and also in terms of the way their districts are, are or maybe they'll see some. We had some nice news from the uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Maybe we'll get some from our own from the U.S. Supreme Court. But once you combine those, it's, it's a little more dangerous. I think. Just a reminder that you are listening to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian, and we're speaking with professors Matthew Stevenson and Richard Gordon about public corruption and how it affects societies and governance. So you're kind of speaking to this, what people are calling the post-truth era, really, and how can you really have a coherent country when people can't even agree on basic reality, which I do think is happening not just in social media, but in you know, if you compare, I have students who are comparing media on things as basic as the clean water rule and looking at, say, Breitbart compared to the New York Times. And it is quite shocking when you see the contrast. So it isn't just social media. It's Fox News. It's Breitbart. It's Infowars. It's I was trying to avoid the, that that three letter word that begins with an F and ends with an S. But I yes, think, you're right. Absolutely, you're, you're absolutely right. I think you're right that this post truth era is probably one of the biggest uh, concerns about this, and I suspect that it is part of why your FBI f- acquaintances that were in the room would argue better than Hillary at this point because of the reframing of reality in this way. I want to get to this question that I foreshadowed earlier on, which is, I mean, is this really a failure of democracy? We keep electing people who are more interested in self-enrichment than the well-being of the country. What what would you say to this, Matthew Stevenson? Gosh, well, so first I might push back slightly on the premise of the question when you said we keep electing people who are, <laughs> I mean, you mean in the United States? Good so catch. So I think that, again, the question is whether Trump is an aberration or whether this is kind of a sign of things to come. I think that Barack Obama, people might disagree with his policies or agree with them, but I don't think I would put him in this category. I, I had a lot of problems with the George W. Bush administration, but I don't think that we see anything like this, the forms of corruption and conflict of interest. I mean, there may have been profoundly bad judgment. There are, of course, questions about Dick Cheney and Halliburton and the oil interests and how much that might have mm-hmm. affected U.S. foreign policy. Uh, those issues have always been around a little bit, but I don't think anything's quite on this scale. A couple of questions I think that I could read into your broader question. One has to do with whether Trump really is an aberration or whether this is a sign of things come. And another has to do with whether this is a kind of failure of, of American democracy or whether there's some kind of problem with American democratic institutions. So we actually address the latter. It is important to remember a few things. One is that Trump lost the popular vote by actually quite a wide margin. And there's this electoral college issue that we're kind of stuck with. So that, that's part of it that I think we need to keep in mind. But there is this question about, well, why why is someone like Trump even able to get close to winning the presidency, right? There are a million but four causes for why he was able to eke out this election win despite losing the popular vote. But as one of my friends put it, the question isn't, you know, how he managed to win given that it was so close. The question is, why wasn't he down by 20 points from the start? Why was he even, why was he even striking distance? So I think we've got a bunch of problems. I think the polarization that Richard just described is a big problem. Um, some of that may be attributed to gerrymandering, but I think, frankly, a, a lot of it isn't. Um, I think the, the Electoral College may be a, a bigger issue and sort of natural geographic sorting. Um, I think we've got uh, another problem, that I, an analysis that I read a while ago, and I wish I could, I could remember the author so I could give credit, um, explained, I think, persuasively, in my view, that right now we have in the United States a situation where you have very strong partisanship and very weak parties, uh, which I think is a, a, a good way to understand at least part of what's going on. By very strong partisanship, I mean that most Democrats and Republicans will vote in the general election for whomever the Democrat or Republican nominee is, no matter what. I, I gather, um, as his friends can fact check this, but, but, but I gather that the single strongest predictor 
for voting for Trump in the general election was whether one was a Republican, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, white collar, blue collar, all this, all this other stuff mattered maybe, but it was basically you're a Republican. And the, the, the opposite is true as well. We have a situation right now where general elections in, 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 for president are essentially coin flips because the, com- the country is very closely divided between people who identify Republican to identify Democrat. There's, there are very few swing voters and small fluctuations, fluctuations rel- with respect to turnout can make a huge difference. So, but at the same time, we have very weak parties in, in the sense that the party elites actually don't have that much control over who becomes the nominee or less control than we might think. Now, a lot of people say, well, isn't that a good thing? Isn't that more democratic? Mm. Well, well, maybe um, except that uh, one of the reasons we might sometimes like elite control over the selection of candidates is precisely because we have this concern that goes back to the framers, right, who are the, the founders of the country who are not, you know, hardcore populist Democrat types, in many, in many ways, they were afraid of, of that system. Uh, there's this concern about populist demagogues. And, you know, there's no system in which the party dominated would, it, would a candidate like Trump be able to get through. He was not the favorite of the party establishment. So I think if, if you have weak parties, it's not necessarily a problem if partisanship isn't super strong because you'll still get enough people who will be turned off if some crazy person gets through the primary process. And if you have very strong partisanship, you know, maybe it's still a problem, but less of a problem if you have kind of sane and sober people exercising a bit more control, undemocratic as that may seem. But when you put these two things together, I think it does create uh, real opportunities for uh, demagogues. Uh, now, again, maybe we might say, well, but isn't that democracy? And then they might say, well, well, maybe, but, <laughs> but not, not necessarily, you know, much like the framers and founders, that form of democracy may not be an unalloyed good. And I think that's something that, that we need to think about. I mean, there's always been this tension in our political culture and our political thought between valuing the voice of the people and responsiveness to the people and so forth with being concerned about demagogues and factions and popular passions and trying to build in controls that will uh, curb what are sometimes thought to be the excesses of of democracy or the failures of democracy. Um, I mean, we've got this issue, though, where a lot of the structural problems we have in our politics are not ones that are amenable to easy fixes, either because they're constitutionally entrenched, like the Electoral College, or because they're due to social and demographic trends, like the increasing tendency of uh, certain political, ethnic, demographic groups to concentrate in large cities near bodies of water and others to concentrate elsewhere uh, that make it really difficult. And on top of that, again, to pick up on Richard's point, changes in media technology that are very difficult to regulate or or legislate. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I'm not really sure frankly exactly what to do about it. Um, and I and I realize now we're getting far beyond my areas of expertise. You started out asking me about corruption, conflict of interest, which are things that I research and know about, and now I'm yeah. I'm sounding like a pundit. I, maybe I don't know I have any idea what I'm talking about, but but that's my my interpretation of the moment that we're living through. You can blame me for that. I, I, I was looking at it sort of big picture and thinking we would at least com- have a conversation about that side of it as well. So I guess what you were leading to, I'm going to now give to Richard Gordon, which is what can we do about it? What? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but that's the tough one. So what are the structures that could do something about preventing, you know, a downslide into this really awful culture of corruption in the U.S. specifically? And if the U.S. goes down that pike, I fear what happens more globally as well. Richard Gordon, what do we do? Well, what do we do? I would – this is also – far moving beyond my areas of at least alleged expertise, but um, I would go back to strengthening the institutions that are not directly controlled politically. And that includes making sure that, oh, something I do know something about, making sure that the folks who are regulating the financial system um, 
and those parts of the financial uh, regulatory structure that are designed to keep bad guys out of the financial system or to catch them or to throw them in jail and take away their assets so that you can actually show people that 2008 is not returning, um, that our uh, prudential regulatory system is working. You can actually show people that we haven't had another collapse of the, of the banking system. And also, um, make sure that you're strengthening anti-money laundering rules, for example, uh, in financial institutions instead of uh, loosening the, uh, the regulatory structure and say, look, we're actually catching these bad guys and we're prosecuting them. And they really are bad guys and they're terrorists and they're, um, and they're money launderers. And um, if you can actually show the public, demonstrate to the public, I'm not so sure we can do this in Congress anymore. You don't seem to be terribly concerned about looking at, at the facts behind policy. But if you can show people, give examples that the institutions are working. And the way you do that is to give them enough support, financial support, and I guess lots of feedback loop and getting popular support as well. Um, it's just like people tend to support clean water when they find out that the, the Clean Water Act is working. I, I'm concerned about how one does that when both state legislatures that control part of the, the supervisory and investigatory institutions in this area are, are so split along with Congress. Um, if you have the president saying we're going to cut funding, we're going to change the laws, reduce the kind of regulations that do result in getting bad guys or do result in ensuring that the financial system stays afloat. Um, if you're cutting the, the financial support and the regulatory structure, that's a problem. But to the extent that you can get around that. I think just showing people that, that government works. Matthew Stevenson, last word. I agree with a lot of that, although I'm not sure that uh, while fixing the financial system and fighting money laundering the laudable goals, I'm not sure that's going to get to some of these fundamental uh, pathologies <laughs> in the political system right now, although I, I entirely support them. One thing that I hope maybe comes out of the, well, there are many things I hope come out of this disastrous situation that we're in, but one of them with respect to the political reform agenda is that it might broaden the conversation a little bit beyond campaign finance reform, money in politics, lobbying, etc. I think that there, we went through a phase, we were still kind of going through it, where many people, especially but not exclusively on what you might think of as the progressive or, or liberal end of the spectrum, tended to attribute most or all of the ills of our uh, politics to um, campaign finance rules and uh, lobbying rules that gave wealthy special interests too much influence. And I totally actually agree that, that our campaign finance rules and lobbying rules need fixing and that uh, wealthy special interests have too much influence. But of course, if it were really true that you know, money bought elections and whoever could raise the most money uh, would win, then Hillary Clinton would be president. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that though, though those, although those issues were important, there was something of an overemphasis on those problems, real as they are, and maybe an underappreciation of other factors that were driving uh, the pathologies of our politics. The other thing I'll say that's somewhat related, it picks up, I think, Richard, on something you said near the end of your comments about getting people to think about government as working or showing that government can work. I think that there is a danger in this scorched earth rhetoric that you certainly saw before and to some extent after the election about how the whole system is rigged, there's no difference between the two parties, everything is controlled by the corporations, government just doesn't work, we need to blow the whole thing up, it's all system, systematically corrupt and, and so on and so forth. And there's also a kind of fashionable cynicism about, ah, oh, it just doesn't matter, they're all a bunch of crooks and liars which I think can be um, really destructive for reasons that are probably self-evident in this context. And again, it's, it's kind of a nuanced message that I'm trying to get across because it's not like the issues that the people who use that rhetoric are identifying aren't real issues. But I do think that unsexy as it is, we need to find ways to better build up this idea that the art of politics and governance, coalition building, compromise, mm -hmm. incremental change, and so forth, are valuable to maybe try to blunt the allure of radical, blow-everything-up kinds of solutions. Um, 
And I think that uh, either a kind of cynicism about everyone or a kind of overly, I don't know, either idealistic or naive embrace of bipartisanship or nonpartisan solutions or getting beyond party competition and so forth are, 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 are and, you know, those things are not always helpful. Um, again, I'm not sure, there are a lot of people to whom you're not going to be able to sell that message, but I, I do think it's, and I think we're start, starting to see this happen as you see more and more people getting engaged in politics, whether it's running for office, working on campaigns, or getting involved in, in, in various kinds of organizing activities. Uh, maybe we're seeing some steps in the right direction, but I think it would be nice to try to get across this idea that politics matters, that elections matter, that candidates are different, and that uh, it's a kind of a long, slow slog that you've got to engage and keep working at if you want to see progress. Well, thank you both so much for being with us again on the Scholar Circle. I think you guys have such tremendous insight. Your research is quite profound and very helpful uh, for people. So thank you for being with us and sharing your thoughts and research with us. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thanks a lot. Matthew Stevenson is a professor at Harvard Law School and the author of Corruption and Democratic Institutions and the book Legislation and Regulation. Richard Gordon is a professor at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, and he's the director of the Program on Financial Integrity, and he's the director of the Institute for Security, Law, and Policy. His publications include Moving Money, International Financial Flows, Taxes, and Money Laundering, Losing the War Against Dirty Money, and Terrorism Financing in the United States. And that's it for today's show. Thank you to all of our guests and to those who make this program possible. To Sad Dongre, our webmaster, Ankine Arasian, Melissa Chiprin, Anais Amin, Mike Hurst, and Tim Page. Most of all, thank you for listening. If you missed part of the show, you can check out our archives at scholarcircle.org, kpfk.org, and please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Armudian, and we'll see you next week.